Ooh, this seems extra bright <laughs> with the light today. Thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah, that's better. <laughs> yeah, it's better to have it up here. We are live. I'm being told we are live, so welcome. Hi there. My name is Andrea Bassing Matney. Welcome to the National Archives Know Your Records program. We are broadcasting live from the National Archives building in Washington, D.C. We are here with an on-site audience, and for those of you who are joining us online, welcome. Before we begin, I'd like to give you a few tips on how to participate in today's program. For those of you who have uh, joined us here on site, uh, hopefully you picked up the few presentation materials that we left on the table outside for you. And I want you to know that we will give you the opportunity to ask questions at the end of the program. It would just be very nice if you could use the microphones that are here in the aisles so that our online audience can hear you. That would be great. For those of you who are joining us online on YouTube, thank you, welcome. You too can also uh, bring up the presentation materials. You'll find hot links on this page. There is a presentation slide uh, hot link and two uh, handouts. You'll also find a link to live captioning. And you will also be able to ask questions. You'll have to log in to the chat feature of this YouTube web page, type in your questions, and we will ask those questions of the presenter for you again at the end of the program. So let's get started. Today's program is entitled African American Soldiers in the Great War. Archives technician Ar uh, Matthew Margis discusses the history of African American soldiers in World War I through the photographic records found at the National Archives Special Media Holdings. Mr. Margis began working at the National Archives as an archives technician in the Still Pitcher branch as of January 2017. He earned a PhD in history from Iowa S State University in 2016, and his dissertation is entitled America's Progressive Army, How the National Guard Grew Out of Progressive Era Reforms. Prior to earning his PhD, he earned an MA in history, also from Iowa State University, and a BA in history from Northern Illinois University. So ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our presenter, Matthew Marges. Okay, thanks everyone. Thank you for having me. Uh, thank you, Andrea, for inviting me to give this presentation today about African-American soldiers during World War I, during the Great War. And as was mentioned, I am basically going to give this presentation uh, to cover two key topics. Um, one is the photographic holdings that we have in the National Archives, specifically up in College Park. That's where the still picture branch is located, Archives 2 in College Park. I will discuss the photographs we have there, uh, specifically related to World War I. And I'm going to do that through this sort of subcategory of World War I, and that's the experience that African-American soldiers went through during this war. And I'm going to try to provide some historical context and show a way that these photographs and the historical context sort of work together, um, especially for researchers, for anyone who's interested in this, for historians, for scholars. This is a great way to look at a different sort of record other than just textual that will help sort of guide your understanding and scholarship and everything else. So. That's going to be the kind of two main points that I'm trying to get across today. Okay. Now, we have, before I kind of get into the context, before I get into the historical elements here, I want to just briefly introduce the two record groups, the two main section, main uh, series that I'm going to be talking about. One is 165WW, the other is 111 SC. Okay. And I will talk about those in greater detail sp specifically as we move forward. But just to kind of introduce the two, it's 165 WW and 111 SC. And those are our two main World War I photographic holdings related to the Army, related to soldiers, related to World War I combat. Those are the two, and they cover everything you can imagine uh, 
about World War I. These are massive, massive photographic holdings. Okay, so I'm only talking about one sort of category of that, and I'm only, due to time constraints and everything else, I'm only able to show you just a fraction of what we have. Um, so this is just a very, very small fraction of the photographs that we have. Okay, and I will also talk a little bit more in depth a little later on today about how to access these photographs on our online catalog. Uh, luckily, both these series are available pretty much in their entirety on our online catalog uh, through archives.gov. Okay. I want to show something, though, as we, as we move forward about the photographs themselves. You'll see how these appear in the presentation. This is not exactly how they'll look when you, if you come to do research or you find them on the catalog. I did this for ease. What they actually will look like is this. And these are how the archives receive these photos. You'll see the picture. They're, they're mounted on these sort of caption screens. And the captions there and the, the number identifier is all included right there on the screen with the photograph. Okay. Um, what I've done is I've taken those captions and for the, for the PowerPoint presentation, made it a little easier to, to hopefully see the photograph and read the captions aside from trying to look at them like this. So moving forward, uh, like I said, I'm going to try to put this into the, the context here of what these black soldiers went through in World War I and how our photographic holdings kind of speak to that greater experience. When the United States entered World War I, uh, about 100 years ago last month, the nation was drastically under manned under force when it came to the military. So as you'll probably be hearing, uh, if anybody watched the PBS special on World War I a few months ago, or a few weeks ago, or as you might be hearing in the news, if you follow the sort of the 100th anniversary celebrations, you'll hear you know, the draft, the anniversary of the draft being used in modern times for the first time is this month. Um, so it was really important that the nation raised an army. And one of the questions that was asked, unfortunately, was will they use African-American soldiers. Uh, this was not anything new. This was, I mean, black soldiers have served in every American war prior to that. Uh, most famously, probably in the Civil War, uh, if you've ever seen the film Glory, speaks about that specifically. Um, the, buff the famous Buffalo Soldiers in the American West. So this isn't anything new, but of course, this is, a, this is an era where segregation is very real, racial animosity is still incredibly high, and it was a question that people were asking. Uh, unfortunately, the Marine Corps ends up completely excluding African Americans from serving. The Navy limits them to very menial roles, uh, specifically basically as stewards or waiters, things like that. Um, but the Army allowed them to serve, but in segregated units. Okay. Now, uh, pictured here, you'll see uh, this is actually this is the Secretary of War at the time, Newton Baker. He's addressing. Uh, basically the junior naval reserve cadets here. So this picture itself doesn't specifically relate to African Americans, but as you can see, again, these series cover a wide variety of topics. Uh, Baker decided that he was going to, his War Department was going to allow African Americans to serve in the Army, but limit them to these very, again, menial, almost labor roles. This did not sit well with civil rights activists. It did not, this did not sit well with other with black leaders around the country. And there was definitely some pushback. And Baker decided he would allow the creation of one all black combat unit, the 92nd Infantry Division. Okay. This would only be coalesced through the draft and through existing regular army segregated black units, which was a very small number, and would basically be the last to go overseas. Only when you know, all the white soldiers had been drafted, would they use the 92nd? So the racial animosity is definitely there. And one thing that I always like to point out is that if you look at the American military at any period in American history, it almost serves as a microcosm of larger social and cultural events. And this is no exception. This photograph here that we have shows a picture of what would become up to that point the largest murder trial in United States history. Uh, this is when a series of black soldiers, they were at a military base, and there was a riot that broke out 
uh, after a fight, after a sort of altercation between some of the black soldiers and some white law enforcement agents. And what ends up happening, as you can see here, is that there are, just so I get my numbers correct, I don't want to give you any wrong information, 64 soldiers will be tried for murder, court-martialed. Uh, eventually, there will be 17, 17 of them will be executed in Texas. So this was, you can see that these, these racial tensions are high, okay? What Baker was willing to do, though, that was a little bit different, is not only was he going to allow the creation of, at this point, one all-black combat division, but he was going to, for the first time in American history, actually enroll black men into the officer corps. Uh, so he established a, what they referred to as the Negro Officers Training Camp, which was at Fort Des Moines in Des Moines, Iowa. And you can see here, this photograph is actually the first uh, person in, enlisting in that, in that new officer training school. Uh, he's listed here, the caption as A. Merrill Willis. Okay, so this was something new, allowing African American soldiers to serve in officer positions. Now, unfortunately, they rarely rose above the junior officer ranks, and in a lot of these units that we'll talk about, they still maintained the sort of white officer, black soldier dynamic, but this was a, a new step forward. Um, and this was another avenue that some of these, these men were able to go through. When they began putting together the 92nd Division, or at least speaking of the 92nd Division, there was one more piece of blowback, and that came from civil rights leaders discussing the National Guard. Okay. Uh, just a quick aside here, I don't want to get too much off track, but when the United States went to war in 1917, they did so under a new structure, and that new structure relegated, at the time, the regular army to a series of divisions numbered 1 through 25. National Guard divisions served 26 up through, theoretically, 75, although the number actually only went to 42. And then anything above 75, 76 and above, would be for the new, what they called the National Army, and that would be conscripted soldiers. So the 92nd was clearly designed to be above 76 as a drafted, mostly drafted division. But that left out a series of all-black National Guard units that already existed around the country, notably the 8th Illinois that had been in existence for quite some time. And this photograph here shows members uh, of the 8th Illinois, actually new recruits, I guess you could say, enlisting in 1917 to join the 8th Illinois Infantry Regiment, which was, again, an all-black National Guard regiment. Earlier that year, in April of 1917, uh, someone I'm going to mention a little bit later, William Hayward, who was a white New Yorker, he got together with some other prominent New York citizens and they formed the 15th New York, which will become a very famous uh, World War I fighting regiment that was also designed as a National Guard regiment. So this, pro this plan left out all the black National Guard soldiers. So they pushed back and Secretary Baker decided that he would create a second all-black combat division the 93rd Provisional Division, which I'm going to talk about in more detail in a few moments. Uh, one more kind of unfortunate piece of history, and I have a picture here of Douglas MacArthur, uh, young Douglas MacArthur, because he's instrumental in another division that comes out of this. That's the 42nd Infantry Division, which is a all-National Guard division. So National Guard divisions, again, numbered 26 through 75. They kind of went geographically. 26 began in the Northeast. For instance, the 30th then is they moved south, so the 30th Infantry Division was uh, North Carolina, and then kind of westward. So Illinois was the 33rd, uh, Iowa and Minnesota were 34th, et cetera, until in Washington was the 41st. Well, this program left out a lot of, they called them orphan National Guard units. So MacArthur and a few others decided we would merge these orphaned units into a new division the 42nd Infantry Division. And, we'll, and he called that, he nicknamed that the Rainbow Division because it stretched across the country like a rainbow. Well, when this was going on, members of the 15th New York looked at this and said, well, we're an orphaned National Guard regiment in our own way. We should be able to be part of this 42nd Infantry Division. So they actually petitioned to join it. And unfortunately, 
the response they received was effectively that black is not one of the colors of the rainbow. So moving on to the, the 93rd Provisional Division. So this is, again, mostly National Guard. It's comprised of the 15th New York, which will be named, renamed the 369th U.S., the 8th Illinois, which will be renamed the 370th. The 371st Regiment was comprised of National Guard soldiers from uh, Washington, D.C., a few from Massachusetts, Maryland, Connecticut, um, and a few other small units that they kind of pulled together. And then the 372nd Regiment was mostly drafted soldiers from South Carolina. Okay, so that is who would comprise this 93rd Provisional Division. But it was provisional in the sense that it would only be formed and only be put together if it could be filled, if there would be enough soldiers to fill the ranks. So they weren't even sure this would really get going. So in, early, in late 1917, the newly renamed 369th New York, which I will refer to them from now on as the 369th after the official renaming, they traveled overseas. They went to France, they landed in Brest, but they were actually attached to a different regiment altogether and were basically forced to do, again, very menial work, trench digging, latrine digging, tearing down, uh, cutting down trees, things like that. Not a lot of combat, even though they were an infantry regiment. While this was going on, General Pershing was locked in a heated debate over amalgamation. All the European commanders basically wanted American soldiers to serve under them, to serve in French or British sectors of the line, and Pershing, as well as President Wilson, were very much opposed to that idea. However, he saw an opportunity here to kind of appease both parties. So the, some of the white soldiers didn't want to serve alongside their black counterparts, even though they were attached to them. And the black soldiers wanted to see combat, wanted to be actually part of the army. And the French and British wanted American troops. So General Pershing actually violates his own stance on amalgamation. And the 93rd Provisional Division will have sort of the unfortunate, I guess, reputation of being the only American combat division in World War I to serve entirely under foreign command, as they will be divvied up. And the 369th will go immediately to the French Army. When the 370th, the Illinois troops arrive, they will go to the French, as will the 371st and 372nd. So they basically all serve under French command. And because of the way it was comprised, they never actually served or trained together as a single division. Uh, so you can sort of see again here how this racial animosity sort of plays out. And these photographs that we here see actually kind of demonstrate this as well. So here's a 165 WW photograph of, as the caption reads, American colored troops camp in France. And this is during machine gun instruction. And one of the things we can see in this photo is if you notice the uniforms they're wearing, specifically the helmets, that this is not your typical American World War I uniform. You know, we think of American soldiers wearing the British helmet, the sort of broad, round helmet, uh, kind of olive drab color. Well, these soldiers are wearing the French helmets. Uh, these are, you, you can't tell from the picture, but they're blue. Uh, they're also using French weapons. Uh, they use French, uh, sometimes French gas masks. Uh, because they served under French commanders. The 369th, uh, they will basically serve under French general, uh, again, I don't want to screw up his name here, uh, Henri Girond, and they'll be part of his elastic defense strategy. Uh, later on, when the 370th arrives, they serve under Marshal Ferdinand Fa, and they will eventually assist the French during the American-led Meuse-Argonne Offensive. And they will also assist the French in their oin ain Offensive. Okay? And basically, the other regiments, 371st, 372nd, they also, as I mentioned, serve under French command. Okay? The other American Combat Division, the 92nd, they don't arrive until much later in 1918. And they really only see action towards the end of the American-led Meuse-Argonne Offensive. But they do as well serve admirably. So that's sort of, again, a little bit, a very brief introduction to the sort of historical background. And if you look at the handouts that are provided, if you're interested in this topic, if you're interested in the experience of black soldiers specifically in World War I, you'll see that there is a section there for additional reading uh, or other places you can look. And 
those are some wonderful resources, wonderful books, wonderful uh, secondary and primary sources that really give you a much bigger, much clearer, more complex picture of this. I just kind of touched on the, the basics here. Um, so I can get into, again, the, the overall point of this discussion, this talk, and that is our records. So what do we have? How can you research them? And what's available? So first, I'll talk about the 165 WW series. This is one of our largest photographic World War I series. And it comes from the 165 record group, which is uh, the Old War Department uh, General Staff Record Group. Uh, this specifically deals with World War I photographs. Now, you can see here, just hold on one second. Um, again, these are the captions. Uh, I'll talk about this more, but you can see this picture here. It mentions uh, Colonel Haywood. Oh, they spelled his name wrong. Um, <laughs> it's Hayward, not Haywood. Um, it also mentions some of the, uh, a couple members of this, which I'll talk about uh, in a little bit. But how you can find 165WW if this opens, hopefully the technology doesn't fail us here, is, again, through our online catalog. And it's, it's moving. Um, Oh, here we go. I apologize for this, but uh, sometimes it takes a minute for the computer to log, to load. So when you get to the online catalog and you type in, I prefer doing the advanced search. It just makes this a little easier. You go to the advanced search, you type in under record group 165, under local identifier, the WW, and it'll get you to, this is actually page 26 of it. It'll get you to, as you can see, there are 105 pages alone of these folders. And they're all listed alphabetically by topic. So when you are going to search, for instance, if you're looking for what we're talking about today, you would scroll down here to the colored troops folder. And when you open that, it would bring up this page here, which just kind of gives you the general information. It'll give you the actual local identifier, the folder number. And you can click on the 152 items described. And there you have all the photographs. And you just can scroll through them. They have the captions there. Uh, and as you can see, there are over 100 photos dealing with the colored troops section. So the best way to get to 165WW is through the catalog. And unfortunately, if you do it this way, it is by category. So if you're looking for something specific, you can sort of think of what topic it could be under and alphabetically find it. What you can also do, which I'll show you here, is if you do an advanced search, and we'll use record group 165, and let's just say we want to look for a specific regiment. So we're going to look for the 369th. When we search, it will bring up what's tagged in 165 from with that with the 369th in the caption. So we can see here that there's four pages of photographs that have that included in the caption that has been put into the online catalog. So that's another way you can search the 165WW is by regiment number. Um, sometimes you might be able to use a name. Uh, that's not always as reliable. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about doing actual research in the archives towards the end. Uh, so th but this is how you can access 165WW through our online catalog. And really importantly, this entire series is online. So you can look at every photograph that we have in 165WW in the online catalog. And as I mentioned earlier, with those caption sheets that are attached, the good thing about that is you can actually see these are the official Army captions. Those aren't ours. Those weren't somebody at the National Archives didn't look at the photograph and write down what they think it was. These are the actual captions that the Army wrote. Uh, most of them were written shortly after the war, 1919, 1920. Uh, but you can sort of, again, get a sense of the type of language that was used, the way people thought about these different war experiences at the time. So it's a, good, it's a really good resource, not only if you're doing research on World War I or a specific topic, but if you're just interested in sort of cultural history, this is a, this is a really good tool that we have available. And I'll get back here to the, back to the slideshow. Okay. 
Now, again, the 165WW goes into a lot of detail, and when, you, when you're in the, the 127 folder uh, that deals specifically with black soldiers, we can see, a, there's, a, again, a lot of different topics covered, and, you know, you know there is just so much in, in this series that it's hard to really get into all the detail here. Um, I'm just going to show you a few images here that really kind of get to what we have. So here, here's, um, again, members of the 366th. This is, uh, they're coming back home on a ship, the Aquitania. Uh, and it'll say here they've all been in action. Uh, and it has the names as well. So you can look, you can see Lieutenant Colonel, uh, or Lieutenant C.L. Abbott from South Dakota, Captain Joseph Lowe uh, from Pacific Grove, California, Lieutenant A.R. Fisher from Lyles, Indiana. Um, and then you see that this uh, Captain R. White from Pine Bluff, Arkansas won the Distinguished Service Cross. Now, this is also interesting because these are all officers and these are all members of the 366th, which was part of the 92nd Provisional Division, or 92nd Division, sorry. Um, so most likely, these officers came through the Fort Des Moines School that I mentioned earlier. So you can see how, again, these photographs kind of tie together, how they help give a part of the bigger picture of what's going on during the war. Here's one of the pictures I really like. Uh, this is this Corporal Fred McIntyre. Uh, you can see it, it might be hard to tell here, but he, he's holding a portrait of Kaiser Wilhelm II. And you can see here he's a member of the 369th, and it says you know, he carried this picture of the Kaiser around with him for good luck throughout his service uh, in the war. Um, I just think this is a really interesting photograph. Um, Again, you kind of get a, a, a little sense of you know maybe who this person was as well, what kind of personality he had. Um, they carried this photograph around with him. Here's another one I like. This is uh, members of the 505th Engineers. Uh, they're returning on the SS Roma. And the caption reads, uh, showing how they used the cold steel on the Huns. And you can see uh, one of the men here with the, uh, the, the rifle. The other with his hands up is wearing a, a German Imperial war helmet. Uh, you can see this other soldier here kind of doing a uh, 1919 photo bomb there in the middle. Um, but again, these are just some, some really interesting photos, and again, it just kind of touches the surface of what we have. Now, one of the interesting things about many of the photos that we have in 165WW are there, we have a lot of pictures, a lot of photographs of the Victory Parade in New York. Okay, this is, now why this is important is because when the war was over, the members of the 93rd Provisional Division, as well as the 92nd Division, were actually denied the right to participate in the American victory parades in France. Uh, there were, of, of course, numerous political reasons for this, but it was racially driven. And though the U.S. was participating in these victory parades, these soldiers were denied that. And actually, the 93rd Provisional Division initially was denied any recognition by the Army, by the U.S. Army. Uh, early reports that came in 1918 and 1919 said that the 369th, 70th, 71st, 72nd served zero days in combat, suffered zero casualties, and basically were not part and had received zero reward, awards. The reason being, of course, the Army cited, well, they didn't serve under American command. They served in a foreign army. This will later be rectified. Uh, they will be given recognition a few years later. And as we'll, as we'll see in a moment here, a lot of the soldiers would eventually be given, many years later, uh, their sort of rightful awards and rightful recognition. But in New York, the, when the 369th returned, they returned to a hero's welcome. Uh, we can see here that Colonel Bill Hayward leading his famous Hell Fighters of 369th. Uh, they're marching down uh, at the corner of 42nd Street and 5th Avenue in New York. And this was a massive victory parade that they participated in. Uh, here you see them carrying their colors, their flags, uh, again, in this, in this massive victory parade in 1919. This is them passing the reviewing stand, and it's difficult to see, but thankfully the names are there of some of the prominent figures who were in that reviewing stand, which included Governor Al Smith, uh, former Governor Charles Whitman. Uh, you see uh, 
the acting mayor of New York is there as well. So this was a much different welcoming than they were receiving from the army itself in France. And this is just, again, part of this kind of troubled history, but again, it's part of, it's, it is a, an important part of what was going on culturally and socially in the United States, especially if you look into sort of the bigger picture of what was going on in 1919 with the, um, the race riots that broke out, the, uh, the sort of remnants of the Spanish flu pandemic, the Red Scare, all this was wrapped up in these kind of heightened tensions and, but here we see in New York, at least, uh, these soldiers receiving the, their due. And interestingly, if you look at what they're wearing, uh, something I'd like to point out, they're now wearing the American-issued helmets for the parade. Another picture we have here uh, is one of, it's two portraits, effectively. And this is how it looks in our catalog. Uh, it's actually two pictures together like this. Um, and it has, and these were two winners of the French Croix de Guerre. Uh, which is their highest military award. Uh, these, one of them you may, may be familiar is Henry Johnson and uh, Nedham Roberts. Uh, these actually, these became kind of famous figures in the United States when, when the war was going on. Um, basically, there was a German raiding party. They almost single-handedly turned it back. And as I mentioned, they'll get the... Um, they will get the Croix de Guerre, they become kind of famous figures because the army, the US army was very strict early in the war about releasing names. Uh, the French army didn't have that same restriction. So these, the names of these two men were all over the French press for their heroism and eventually would make their way into the American press. So early in the American war, or early in the war when the US was involved, some of the, the two sort of famous war heroes were these African-American soldiers who weren't even allowed to serve in a US command. Uh, they were serving under French soldiers. Um, and they earned these, these nicknames. Um, and they are, of course, denied any American awards until uh, 1991 and 2015, when they will be awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor, or the Medal of Honor, excuse me, uh, posthumously by um, President uh, George H.W. Bush and uh, Barack Obama more recently. So it, of course, took some time, but um, they were eventually given the, the recognition for at least that early service they deserved. OK. Now, the other series that we have is 111 SC. I've mentioned this as well. And as you can see from this photograph, just like 165 WW, the 111 SC has these wonderful caption sheets attached uh, with all the information. Now, 111SC is a little bit different. This is, 111 is, um, these are the Army Signal Corps records, okay? And this is a huge series, okay? 111 is also the series, if you're looking for Civil War photographs, the Matthew Brady stuff, that's part of 111. It's a different series, it's 111B, but you can see that 111 is, is massive, and SC actually starts before World War I, really, and goes up through World War II, uh, even into Vietnam, so, and the Cold War. So if you're looking for 111SC and you come to the archives looking for it, you have to kind of specify World War I or World War II, because uh, these, this is a very, very massive series, and it covers a lot. Now, luckily, 111SC, as I mentioned, just like 165WW, this has been, after a massive digitization campaign, a lot of hard work from our archive staff, from our civilian volunteers, um, and from the, this new ongoing civilian archivist project, these are also available in the catalog. Uh, 111SC as well is there. Now it's slightly different how you would do the search for 111SC just because this is organized by the number, by the item number. Um, so as you can see right in here, uh, again, very, very massive, 44,486 items described in the catalog. When you go to it, when you open it, you'll see the first section here that just sort of show the photographs. These are parts of 111SC that had been digitized years ago 
that aren't specifically the World War I photographs. They're just sort of a, a, a collection. So you need to go forward a little bit. Um, I like using doing 100 per page. But you need to go forward a little bit. Um, for example, you go to the 10th page and well, maybe the 11th. Sorry. And there, and you'll see that these have, and you can tell that which ones are the World War One specific photographs because you can see they ha how they're set up there with the with the caption. So the issue with this is, you'll need to know what you're looking for, uh, or or you can just sort of look for it this way. Um, but if you have the item number, you can type that in, and it can bring up the exact photograph. Otherwise, just like with the 165 WW, you can try sort of the captioning approach. You can use uh, regiment, you can use unit number, uh, other things that can identify it in the search to try to narrow it down. Um, just be, be aware that right now this is kind of an ongoing project. We're not 100% finished with it yet. A lot of the, the civilian archivist project and some of the, we have a lot of, again, volunteers working to uh, get all the captions digitized. And once that's done, using the catalog to find these photographs will be much easier. But um, again, we're talking about thousands and thousands of photographs, so this takes time. Uh, the fact that it was able to get done so quickly is, again, a testament to the archive staff who worked very hard to, to get this stuff available uh, for this 100th anniversary of the U.S. entering, entering the war. Um, but again, they're both available on the catalog, and like I mentioned earlier, I will talk about actually doing physical research in a little bit. So back to 111 SC. Uh, Again, this is, this is a very massive, massive series, so I only picked a few photographs here. But again, these photographs kind of speak to the bigger picture. Here we see, um, this is, it says, this is at Camp Mead, uh, the 79th Division. Okay, now, 79th Division, well, that's strange. I've been talking about the 92nd and the 93rd. I thought those were the only two black combat divisions. Well, exactly. But we see here that this Captain O'Donovan is instructing 1,000 colored troops in bayonet movements. Well, that was because, due particularly to fear among populations at military camps in the country, there was this very irrational fear of, if we have an entire division training together, what's going to happen to the racial harmony that exists, especially in these southern camps? So they weren't allowed to train together until they arrived in France. So different regiments, different companies, different uh, battalions served with other combat divisions, at least in training, um, in a very sort of isolated sense and weren't actually put together until the 92nd arrived in France throughout the course of the middle of 1918. So here we see again this uh, members of the 92nd learning some of their bayonet movements along with the 79th Division in Camp Mead, Maryland. I decided to, for the 111 SC to kind of pick a little, a few, a few more light-hearted uh, photographs. Um, of course, you know, after all, you're not, these soldiers weren't in the front lines 365 days a year. So here we see uh, American troops, the 369th, formerly the 15th New York, engaged in a, in basically a sports and games demonstration at Saint Nazaire, France. Uh, this is a tug of war contest between members of the 369th, and uh, you can see between their um, there's a machine gun company involved, or they, that uh, this George F. Hinton of the machine gun company is the referee, and you, you can just see here that there's this ongoing. You know, it's not all, it's not all combat all the time. Uh, here we see a, a baseball game. Uh, the umpire is Colonel Hayward. Uh, you can see him, according to the captioning here, making a close call at the plate uh, between members of the 369th. Uh, unfortunately, you can see sort of the, some of the confusion with the numbering system. 369th goes back to 15th, back to 369th. Um, the reasoning for the, chain, the numbering change was, again, quite straightforward. The Army War Department wanted World War I to, they wanted to break that sort of older 19th century ideal of a state-based volunteer army. So if you think of Civil War regiments, for example, the 12th Illinois, you know, the 27th New York, um, that would volunteer and serve in the Union Army. They wanted to break that. They wanted it to be a, a unified 
American, singular American army. So they broke all the National Guard state designators permanently. So uh, they became these new numerical designators, whether, again, 15th becomes 369th. The third Iowa becomes the uh, 168th, for example. Uh, the reasoning for this is fairly straightforward, but you can see some of the confusion among uh, National Guard people, captioners. Um, what do you call them? You call them the 15th, 369th. Is it going to go back to the 15th after the war? It didn't. Um, but again, you can see these photographs give a, another little indication of the ongoing greater historical context here. So quick conclusion. This is another picture I like of uh, two wounded soldiers returning home um, with the, uh, the German dogs they captured. Uh, and of course, they give them the, uh, the, new, the names uh, Crown Prince and then Kaiser Bill. Um, just another good kind of photograph I like. But I want to reiterate here the two main holdings we have, uh, 165WW111SC. I also want to, once again, I know I've mentioned it probably 100 times. I want to mention it one more time. Uh, these are very, very large, large series. So, you know, these cover every different element of World War I, at least from the American perspective. So you can do research on a lot of different topics, not just black soldiers. You can do photographic research on pretty much anything from the First World War. If you're interested in American aircraft engines, there are a lot of pictures of American aircraft engines. Okay. Um, as far as doing research, if you want to do hands-on research in the National Archives, all these photographs are held in the stills picture branch at Archives 2 in College Park. We have a research room there that the research staff is more than willing to help you if you want to have access to these photographs, if you want to make a high-resolution scan, They'll help you find them on the public access computers. And we also have a few more resources that aren't available on the catalog, such as finding aids. We also have some caption cards. So if you're, if you're looking for a specific unit, a specific regiment, you can look through the caption card and find that regiment and find all the photographs that, according to the captions we were given, have them, have them pictured. Uh, there's also a limited personalities caption card set that some of these photographs, especially from 111SC, that have names listed. If there's a name listed, there's, there's a good chance there's probably a caption card with that. So if you are doing genealogical research and you do know a specific name, if, if it's listed on one of the photographs, you would probably be able to find it. Now, unfortunately, a lot of them don't have those names listed, so it's kind of a shot in the dark. But if you know the regiment, there's a better chance you might at least get some photographs of the regiment. Uh, we also have, of course, other series that deal with World War I. Um, but if you're looking for the sort of soldiers, the combat, these are the two, 165WW and 111SC. And just again, to kind of review, a lot of people think that the you know, photographs, they think photographs are sort of a secondary to textual research. And I think they're, they definitely work together. These photographs, as I mentioned, help provide some context, at least some, some visual context, to the overall experience of the First World War, uh, both positive and negative. Um, and these kind of, they, they give you a little bit of the cultural understanding as well. One of the earlier photographs I showed of the, of the men enlisting, uh, not only in the 8th Illinois, when they were lined up to, to enlist in the infantry, but those soldiers who were uh, enlisting in the, officer, in the officer training corps. You can see that they were dressed in very nice clothes. These are probably their, their the only suit they probably own, um, and they're making sure they look good enlisting because they want to, again, show off th that this is, an, this is an important event, that they're, they're doing this with uh, distinction, right? So these photographs show some cultural, some social things, and the captions also add to that. So these are amazing photographs, two amazing series we have, and there's a lot of different ways to do research. And I hope that this presentation kind of showed a little bit of not only the what we have, but also added a little bit of the historical context um, to a sort of very complex period in American history. Um, so with that, I will take any questions anybody might have. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Uh, for those of you who are uh, on site, pardon my back, if you could make your way to the microphone. In the meanwhile, I do have a question that came online. Uh, there's a couple of questions here. The first one is, uh, what percentage of World War I photos, I had the same question, it's probably not a fair question to ask, it's because you were so thorough. So what percentage of World War I photos are online versus at Archives 2? Well, as far as these two series go, the 111SC and the 165WW, um, 165WW is 100% on the catalog. Um, and 111SC, at least the World War I portion of it, uh, is pretty close to 100%. Uh, there might still be a few outliers that are in the lab being processed now, but as far as I know, um, within, if they're not 100% up now, they will be very, very shortly. Um, and the captioning project is getting those captions on there as well. So if you're looking for these two series, uh, the 165 and the 111, at least for the World War I portion, uh, those are all on the catalog. Um, World War II for 111SC isn't quite there yet, maybe in the future. Um, but if you're looking for, the, the, for these two series, uh, you can definitely find them there. Uh, I'm just going to follow up really quick uh, because while you're on that topic, and then we'll go to the gentleman here in, on site. Uh, so they were going to ask that very question you answered, if the same records are used for World War II, and uh, what are the GR numbers? Do you know what uh, GR they're referring to? Um, Unless they meant RW. <laughs> it might, I mean, the... the, or, the I think they met, must have met, transposed RG, what record group? Yeah, um, um, the record group, so again, the, the 165 is the record group for the, uh, the one, and then 111 is the record group for uh, the Signal Corps. So those are the two, um, the two record group numbers. Okay, so the same for World War II. Then. Yeah, for World War II, it's the 111 SC, but it's, it, it can be a little bit, um, if, if you don't know, it's a little complicated. They're both the same technical series, but the numbers kind of start over. So if you're doing research, you just have to specify I'm doing World War I or World War II. Uh, it's because it's both 111 SC. So, thanks. So my question is about the Victory Parade or parades in New York City. Um, given that the Democratic Party was considerably more racist than the Republicans during World War I and even called itself the white man's party, um, why did New York proved more hospitable to parades than, I don't know, Chicago or, or other, or maybe it didn't, maybe there were also parades in some other major cities. Yeah, um, there, were, there were some other victory parades. Um, New York is just, we have a lot of photographs of that, that's why I, I chose that one. And I can't really, I don't know if I can give you the, the specific answer, I can talk about what I would speculate was, again, the, the 369th earned a very, they earned, they earned a reputation over there as the Harlem Hellfighters. Uh, mm -hmm. Again, I mentioned that they were in the American press. Um, so while the army itself, when it came to what they were trying to present in Europe, was one thing, when it comes home, um, there was a significant population, significant African-American population in New York, and a significant portion of the white population that had heard the sort of famous tales of this, these Harlem Hellfighters. Yeah. And so it would almost be... I would speculate impossible to leave them out of that yeah. because and of course the boats good. come back into New York City itself. Right. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Are there any more questions from uh, our folks here on site? And I'm looking to see if we have any online. We don't have any more online. Going once. Going twice. Okay. Well, while I make my way up there. So, are there any other, we'll give you one more opportunity. If not, um, I just wanted to point out that if you think of something later for this presentation or any, that you can send a message to inquire at nara.gov. That's I-N-Q-U-I-R-E at nara.gov. So, thank you so much for joining us today on behalf of the National Archives and for thank Mr. You. Marges, thank you for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you again for future Know Your Records programs. Thank you very much.